Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. And I think you took some of my papers with you. <laughs> First of all, um, allow me also to to welcome the two other speakers uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Professor Manus Marangodakis uh, could make this. He is uh, sort of the local sociologist, or one of them. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that he hasn't uh, a broad international experience, but he is connected to the University of the Aegean, and uh, uh, I'm very happy that he agreed to comment on my paper. And also Tale Sten Jonsen, uh, my colleague at the University of Agda, uh, associate professor uh, in uh, the Institute of uh, Sociology and Social Work, um, <coughs> who will uh, give a talk based on her PhD on uh, peace building in Ethiopia about peace and love. Now, when it comes to, to my uh, uh, lecture here, um, I fell for the temptation of using uh, the title of a rather sentimental song, Love is a Many Splendid Thing. Uh, it's about love in contemporary sociology. There isn't really very much about religion in it, uh, that may be a weakness, but it's a more general approach to, to love in sociology. So, but let me start with a brief remark uh, on the challenges of uh, finding some common ground for our discussions at this seminar. Uh, there are some challenges there. We come from different disciplines. We cover a very large time span from antiquity to contemporary society. Um, and also, some contributions have focused on what uh, the sociologist Max Weber used to call religious virtuosi, that is, specially gifted people, or at least seen that way by their followers, uh, striving for perfection within their own religious tradition. While sociology deals mainly with the life of people in general, common people. Moreover, sociologists' self-understanding is that it is analytical and descriptive more than explicitly normative, even if there is certainly some implicit normativity in sociologists' uh, approaches. But despite these differences among us, um, there may be bridges between the contributions. And thinking of the book that we are going to discuss uh, more in detail this afternoon, I think it may be important to, to look for some bridges, sort of to bind the book together. Um, I will point to at least some questions, some issues that seem to be common for us, even if the answers in the various disciplines may go in different directions. So, what characterizes a sociological approach? The Norwegian sociologist Gudmund Hernes once said with tongue in cheek, sociology is about everything except people. His point 
was that sociological perspectives are often directed towards social structures and social relations and not towards individuals as such. But there has been a tendency in recent sociology to approach questions of identity, of self-understanding, of emotions, topics that has traditionally been topics for psychology. Hence, love has become a more common topic for sociologists than only a couple of decades ago. But this does not mean that sociology has given up its characteristical relational and structural perspectives. <clears throat> An example of this can be found in the book Why Love Hurts, written by sociologist Eva Illus. This is one of the more interesting sociological treatments of the phenomenon of love in recent years. Illus reminds us that Freudian and later psychology has taught us that love and its failures should be explained by the psychic history of the individual. So, to the extent that we find that there is a freedom of action, many of us relegate the romantic and the erotic to the private realm and to private responsibility. Contrary to this, Illus seeks what is wrong, not in the individual uh, psychic apparatus, but in what she calls the set of social and cultural tensions that have come to structure modern selves and identities. We will come back to the specific tensions under late capitalism that Illus identifies. On a general level, she insists on the profoundly social nature of even our most intimate feelings. And I think there are some interesting parallels there uh, with uh, some of the church fathers and the philosophers of antiquity, the relationality of uh, even the most intimate feelings. She draws an interesting parallel to how sociology has changed our perspectives on poverty, from individual laziness and incompetence over to more social explanations, such as structures of unequal resources and uh, relations. Another important contributor to our general understanding of love is, of course, literary fiction. Authors have, to a large extent, approached love in a romantic and anti-institutional way. Much literary fiction has joined other social and cultural forces in a democratic struggle a struggle for the right to enjoy love relations across institutional borders in society. Romeo and Juliet being the iconic example. The history of literature and film <clears throat> is full of idealized and romanticized representations of love. However, more recent fiction about love tend to be more problem-oriented dwelling on the agony, irritation, boredom or power struggles in love relations. I have noted that uh, sociologists are rather reticent when it comes to defining love. Recent sociology is afraid to be accused of being essentialist. The drive towards social constructionism in contemporary sociology has as its consequence that sociologists study not what love is essentially, but people's understanding of love, what counts as love 
in society, how we are expressing and doing love. Nevertheless, after having read quite a number of books and articles on love written by sociologists, I see that there are plenty of implicit and sometimes explicit um, uh, statements um, in these articles connected the phenomenon of love to specific characteristics. Despite the fact that the same text can start with programmatic anti-essentialist uh, expressions, statements. The same double approach is, by the way, typical for the treatment of religion, of power, of politics, and many other phenomena studied by sociologists. Most of us tend to end up in a, a very moderate social constructionism. What we study exists, we believe, outside our perception of it, outside language, but we have some trouble giving universal definitions because phenomena are interpreted differently in different contexts. That seems to be the approach of mainstream sociology today. The aim of this lecture is to give an overview of some recent sociological contributions to the study of love and to add some reflections of my own. The structure is as follows. First, I will present some of the characteristics of love that seem to be common to many sociologists. I will do that partly in comparison with another intimate and often long-lasting relationship, namely friendship. I will also compare falling in love, infatuation if you will, with more permanent love relationships. Then I will concentrate on some sociological theories about love in late modern society. And in this context, I will discuss the gender dimension of contemporary love relationship. Is love still dominated by men? Finally, one theory about love in late modern society claims that love has become more a matter of rational choice than before. My last point will therefore be to discuss a rational choice theory of love. Is love really a kind of disguised and beautified selfishness? And I think at that point there are also some interesting bridges over to some of antiquities writings and early Christianity as well. My focus will be on love in Western society. Indeed, it is my impression that much of the theorizing and empirical work in contemporary sociology deal with middle class people, sometimes upper middle class people, like sociologists. And this will also color my presentation. I admit that this is a severe limitation, and I feel even more uneasy about another narrowing down of my topic. I will concentrate on heterosexual love relations between adults. This excludes homosexual relations. It excludes love between parents and children, love between siblings, and even the characteristics of love understood as uh, generosity, empathy, altruism, directed towards people not closely related. Love your enemies. The uh, words from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount represent a critical perspective on my delimitation of the topic. It reminds us of a theme that neither sociology nor psychology have treated very much lately and that has been up in the conversations earlier in this seminar. Why is it that we love those near to us more than distant people? And even more difficult, 
how can we expand the scope of love? My defense for concentrating on love relationships between men and women is very pragmatic and by no means an expression of my normative hierarchy. Firstly, the time frame I have is limited. Secondly, what I have studied, uh, this is what I have studied. So this is what I can say something about. Maybe there are some insights from this topic that can be transferred to a wider range of love relationships, but I have to leave it to you to consider that. Now about falling in love and staying there. When is a love relationship made more permanent? There are of course many possible answers to that question. One, um, well, sociologists are not always that funny, but one answer coming from a sociologist stems from Jean-Claude Kaufmann. No relation, I think. Um, a couple, he says, has become a couple when two people buy a washing machine together. <laughs> this leads us to the more monotonous and practical dimensions of love. Some sociologists contrast the early period of falling in love and the following more sober period of choices and adjustments to be made in order to establish and maintain a more permanent relationship. Falling in love feels good, even if it may create some nervousness. One is seen by the partner and being the object of uncritical attention, uh, an improvement of one's self-image occurs. Falling in love implies a vision of who we want to be, a dream of a more perfect life, and at the same time, many who describe this initial period of doing love underline that the focus is here and now. Often infatuation is seen as irrational, while more permanent love relations are seen as more rational and reflexive. The um, <clears throat> Italian sociologist Francesco Alberone describes falling in love as a collective movement, usually involving two, with much spontaneity. It is an extraordinary period with little planning ahead. The Norwegian sociologist Willem Aubert once wrote a book on uh, topics that, as he saw it, seldom were treated in sociology. It should be added that many of his topics have been taken up by sociologists uh, later. Uh, Aubert wrote about innovation, about sleep, about tourism, and one of the chapters in this book, The Hidden Society, is about love. He makes an interesting comparison of falling in love and falling ill. Both happenings have an element of not being completely responsible. One is hit by something, and this makes it possible to transcend established norms without drowning in shame or guilt, he says. The main message in Elvis Presley's mega hit, can't help falling in love, springs to mind. Then, provided none of the two involved make, makes an exit, there is usually a transition to a more permanent relationship, involving an acknowledgement that not everything is possible. However, the initial infatuation can linger on for a long time, even if the physical distance sometimes, in other instances, can weaken the initial fascination. Um, but according to a recent study by the German sociologists Ulrich Beck and Elisabeth Beck Gernsheim, Distant Love, that's the title of their book, Distant Love, people in love who live far apart from each other, can live on for a long time, nourished by sporadic, now-oriented meetings. 
<coughs> a somewhat cynical remark would be that it is easier to idealize from a distance. We can conclude from this specter of different descriptions that falling in love can be described as an escape from daily routines, an ecstasy, if you will. As we have seen, the more permanent love relationship is sometimes contrasted very strongly to the face of falling in love. Conditions of recruitment to love seem to be different from conditions for maintenance. For instance, it is a widespread belief that opposites may attract each other in this initial phase, while many empirical studies support the claim that mutual understanding is important to make the relation last. And mutual understanding and communication are of course often facilitated by similarity in background, in values, in interests. A successful relationship is often described by means of metaphors like the maturing of love, a growing together through daily common routines and projects, occasional confirming rituals, and processes of learning and mutual adaption. Of course, children, if and when they come, are important. Children may strain love relationships, but they probably strengthen love more often, and at least the presence of children makes it more difficult to break up. Along these lines, the Swedish sociologist Jövan Arne has done a comparison between love and friendship, partly based on interviews with Swedish couples. Common for friendship and love seems to be intimate knowledge of both parties' strengths and weaknesses. There is much mutual trust and emotions are important in both kinds of relationships. There are also widespread notions on uh, differences between friendship and love. For instance, that friendship is more about understanding, while love is more about devotion. One of sociology's classical figures, Georg Simmel, once wrote that friendship is without love's intensity. Sexuality is usually a part of love relationships. It, occur, it occurs more seldom in friendships, although sex among friends may have become more common in later years. Long-lasting love is also usually more institutionalized than friendships. Through marriage, or as in many countries today, increasingly formalized forms of cohabitation. Love does not necessarily strike at first sight. Friendship can develop into love, and love can contain an important dimension of friendship. In a perceptive passage, Jöran Arne, the Swedish sociologist, notes that when lovers focus mainly on memories, love seems to have changed into friendship. Friendship and shared challenges does not seem to be enough. According to the informants in Arne's uh, study, and also the Norwegian sociologist Tove Targo's study of uh, Scandinavian couples, mostly urban and uh, middle class, there must be some excitement even after several years. Without this extra, daily projects can be sources of irritation, uh, faith, so trust and security can become boring. Often, but not always, this extra element is connected to sexuality. One possible conclusion here is that one should not contrast completely falling in love and being able to stay there.
Now, about love in late modern consumer society. Society is changing, and so is sociological reflection. Much traditional sociology before the 1970s treated love <coughs> as part of the sociology of family. In accordance with the then dominating structural functional paradigm, love was seen as a functional phenomenon able to strengthen useful family relations in society. Furthermore, a relatively fixed normative division of labor between husband and wife was seen by sociologists as functional for the institution of marriage and also secure for the individuals involved as well as useful for the stability of society. From the 1970s on, and rather quickly, new perspectives came from sociology, following feminism and changed forms of relationships out there in society. Norms ab against sexual practices before or outside formal marriage changed rapidly from the 1960s and 1970s. Cohabitation without marriage became very common. A decade or two later, same-sex love relations became more legitimate. Cohabitation and same-sex relations have become legally formalized in many countries, but as voluntary arrangements, voluntary formalizations. Sociologists have studied and documented these changes and have become more interested in asymmetric relations in love relationships as part of uh, an increased interest in uh, gender perspectives and also as part of the sociological move from harmony-seeking functionalism to a more conflict-oriented sociology. We will return to gender perspectives on love. But first, let us have a closer look at one important theme in uh, current sociology, the individualization of everything, including love. Sociological textbooks today are full of claims that people, at least in the West, have moved from fate to choice, from binding structures and uh, traditions to individual freedom. There are other voices trying to remind us that we still live under social constraints, although maybe more subtle than before. But it is difficult to disagree that at least in Western middle-class societies, people have more freedom than before to construct and plan their lives, not least in the realm of intimate relations. What was institutionalized and taken for granted is now to a greater extent matters to be chosen and negotiated. Sociologists sometimes transcend the descriptive and analytical modes and start evaluating changes in society. Anthony Giddens, the British sociologist, is probably the most optimistic example of a sociologist welcoming changes in intimate life especially in two books, Modernity and Self-Identity and The Transformation of Intimacy with the subtitle Sexuality, Love and Eroticism from 94. He contrasted what he called pure relationships to close personal ties in traditional contexts. A pure relationship is not anchored in external conditions of social and economic life. It's more free-floating, you might say. The pure relationship is sought only for what it can bring to the partners involved. Uh, an individual finds 
his or her self-identity affirmed in a pure relationship. The relationship depends on mutual trust between partners, which in turn is closely related to uh, the achievement of intimacy. Trust has no external support and must be developed first and foremost on the basis of intimacy. Intimacy is primarily a matter of emotional communication based on equality between the two. A pure relationship is established by two individuals for its own sake and it can be entered and exited voluntarily. Giddens celebrated the pure relationship as a sign of increased freedom, even as part of a process towards a more democratic society. Other sociologists have had reservations and looked upon Giddens' concept as an idealization. Apart from questioning the equality between men and women, even in contemporary society, Many sociologists have doubted that a pure relationship is possible even in a wealthy and individualized society. And there are practical objections. The pure relationship seems to be unrealistically loosely connected to the surrounding society. There are still practical and economical concerns. There may be children involved and so on. Many sociologists have criticized Giddens on a general level for exaggerating the weakening of traditions and normative frames in late modern society. <coughs> Other sociologists have questioned the notion that this free-floating relationship called pure in itself is the way to happiness. <coughs> the Polish-British sociologist Sigmund Baumann referred to by Paul yesterday, is one of the leading presenters of ambiguity and ambivalence, ambivalence as a central trait in contemporary society. In many ways he welcomes freedom, but he describes a process where increased freedom to choose fosters difficulties in choosing. Modernity has brought increased freedom but also emotional misery and insecurity. In his book, Postmodern Ethics, Baumann argues that lasting love can be supported by that which is fixed and firmly established. In this case, the couple has a common codex defining the frames of their relationship. The quality of their relationship is not dependent upon shifting moods. Liquid love, on the other hand, is more dynamic, but also more calculating and frail. Both parties tend to calculate gains and losses in each given situation. While fixation may result in a relationship characterized by duty and routine, liquid love tends to result in instability and insecurity, especially for the weaker partner. Uh, Baumann adds. Perhaps, he says, it is necessary to establish a certain fixation as a bulwark for love. He takes up this thread again in the book Liquid Love, 10 years later, 2003, lamenting the tendency to substitute relationships with networking, implying that consumer society changes love relationships so that they become more insecure and with more self-interest involved. In a network, connecting and disconnecting are equally legitimate choices. While Sigmund Baumann is true to the, his picture of the ambiguities of liquid mo modernity, Pascal Bruckner one of the so-called French new philosophers is more of a definite and settled cultural pessimist. The contemporary understanding of love gives priority to feeling over obligation, he says. 
Among other things, this change is due to the fact that children's birth today can be controlled with much accuracy. So, love has become fueled by transgression, he says. It has become by definition a transcending force and hence it erodes marriage relations. Love is seen as so central to a successful marriage that disappointment is inevitable in marriage. This widespread idealized and romantic understanding of love is undermining stable love relations, according to Bruckner. I refer to him here also as an example of a not very sociological approach. In my opinion, he is representative of some social philosophers who come up with interesting and provocative but very sweeping generalizations uninhibited by nuanced empirical studies. So let's hurry back to sociology. In her book, Why Love Hurts, Eva Illus is thinking in the same direction as Baumann. Choice has become a central trait in late modern consumer society, not only on commercial markets, but also seeping into personal relations. Furthermore, she states that love in contemporary society is the terrain par excellence of ontological insecurity. The very knowledge of divorce rates may increase feelings of insecurity as well as calculations. Instability and continual evaluations and negotiations may lead to disappointment, to fear of rejection, to irony, to am ambivalence and a cooling down of passions. Continual comparisons between alternatives dampen strong emotions and may lead to less commitment to love. Illus declares her support for most of the changes in late modern societies in the direction of more equality between, between the sexes, but she still claims that men tend to profit more than women from the marketization of relationships. We will follow her line of reasoning when we move over to having a closer look at the gender dimension. <clears throat> According to Giddens, both material and psychological changes have allowed women to stake a claim to equality in late modern societies. Um, Giddens call women emotional revolutionaries of modernity. Eva Illus does not go into a direct critique of Giddens, but she tells another story, an alternative story in the book Why Love Hurts, which came out a couple of years ago. Again, she profiles herself very explicitly as a sociologist. Seemingly inner conflicts and desires have a basis in society, she reminds us. Love is shaped by social relations and institutions, and love circulates in a marketplace of unequal actors. Mate sele selection now takes place in a highly competitive market. Marriage markets have been deregulated. This means more space for individual choice, but these changes seem to favor men more than women. Attractiveness and sexual capital have become more important to build recognition <coughs> and self-esteem. <coughs> Intimate relations have been commercialized. Consumer culture has been extremely efficient in sexualizing bodies and relationships. As late modern society still has more men than women, in the public sphere, women are more dependent than men on success in intimate relations. Marriage or cohabitation is more important for women as men still compete more in the fields of economic and occupational achievement. 
Erotic capital can lead to upward social mobility, especially for women. Men have far more sexual and emotional choices than women. Men are more relaxed in the romantic field. They can afford to stay in the market-like field longer, and they can have a broader sample of women to choose from. Women's career in the sexual field has a more limited time span, limited by the reproduction period, and by an ageism that hits women more than men. In short, women are more vulnerable actors on this competitive market. There is much to be said in favor of Eva Illu's line of argument, I think. The concept of a perfect market turns out to be a theoretical fantasy here as well. However, there are some, some contextual limitations to the validity of the story. It is more relevant in the West than elsewhere, and it is more relevant in a well-educated middle class than in other parts of society. One misunderstanding should be warned against. Of course, this is not a story about ahistorical and timeless differences between men and women. In a surprisingly short time, women's position in most societies has changed very much. Still, empirical studies show that women tend to do most of the emotional work in love relationships, and also that women want more talkative men and more emotional intimacy than they get. However, Duncombe and Marston, summing up several studies a few years ago, uh, concluded that these differences between men and women are not very strong and that differences between cultures and internal variations uh, in each uh, uh, gender is uh, larger. Men are not from Mars and women from Venus. At least they travel around a bit. Um, according to this Oscar-winning film song from 1955, love is a many splendid thing. But discussing power relation and asymmetry of power in love relationships raises the question of whether love is fundamentally a power game with selfish actors. Or to put it more generally, and I think it was Paul who uh, stated that question yesterday, or put that question, is altruistic love possible? Philosophers and theologians have approached this question for centuries, as we've seen in the seminar. It is also an issue to struggle with for sociologists. But unlike most theologians, sociologists do not bring God into the discussion. Most sociologists, including religious sociologists, are methodological atheists. They do not necessarily reject the possibility of religious truth, but they put the question of religious truth in brackets. They approach the issue of the possibility of altruistic love more as an empirical question. Of course, there is also an element of interpretation here, as empirical material is ambiguous. But these sociological assessments take place within a social immanent framework. So, are all lovers selfish devils in disguise? Uh, some strong versions of rational choice theory come very close to such an axiom. Inspired by widespread theories of human behavior in economics, not all uh, economists are like that, but uh, it's a, traditionally a strong uh, paradigm in economics. And it's been taken over by some sociologists who have expanded the scope of such rational choice theories 
to fields outside commercial relations, to religion, to families, to love relationships. Can't buy me love, Lennon and McCartney claim, but that's what we do all the time, buying and selling love, some sociologists say. The main idea in these strong theories, stripped of all modifications, is that uh, people tend to maximize their self-interest and that they calculate gains and losses in any situation in a rational way. Now there is no point in denying that this can be a fruitful critical perspective and tempting to use for any sociologist faced with self-presentations and le legitimations filled with embellishment and altruistic facades. Love can be seen as an investment in emotional capital motivated by an expected outcome. But as an all-encompassing theory of uh, love, this becomes much too reductionist. Let me here refer to one of sociology's founding fathers, Max Weber, who differentiated between four different types of action. Traditional action, that is action governed by habit and taken for granted norms. Effective action, driven by emotions. Thirdly, actions driven by value rationality, that is act, action based on a strong commitment to values and technical rational action, also called instrumental action, in order to obtain defined goals. goals. One way of making clear the two last types of action, or the difference between them, could be to say that certain actions that seem instrumentally rational will not be chosen for moral or value-based reasons. <coughs> Apropos Anamari's uh, discussion uh, the other day, yesterday. Uh, we could add that even if there is a strong element of rationality and calculation in Weber's instrumental rationality, the object of this kind of action, the aim, is not by definition dominated by self-interest. I think that uh, good old Max Weber offers us richer and less reductionist tools of interpretation than rational choice theory. Furthermore, there are ethical concerns here. Rational choice theory presupposes that people are individualistic, rational, strategic, and in the strong version of the theory, also selfish. Apart from a critique of this universal model of man on empirical grounds, my ethical worry is that this can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If enough people begin to believe that everybody else is rational um, and that they have to adapt to this situation among wolves, so to speak, then the model can become reality, even if it was not the case at the outset. Let us take this with us into the realm of love relationships. It is true that reciprocity usually characterizes such relationships. There is an exchange of obligations, efforts, pleasures and many other things. Rational choice theory would predict that the exchange process would come to a halt if one of the parties found out that the gains over time were much smaller than the investments. But the situation is also different from an economic market transaction. The prices are often not fixed and clear, and a border between gift and demand is often ambiguous in love relations. Uh, for instance, in a sexual act driven by consent, the difference between giving and taking is often blurred or non-existent. Furthermore, the transactions are usually embedded in a broader framework of normativity and meaning. Even within also the framework of rational choice, there is something called transaction costs. A stable relationship 
without frequent renegotiations and calculations, save time and gives security. The same reflection can be made about negotiations. Those saying that there are more negotiations than before in love relationships, they are probably right. In a relatively early phase, when the relationship is made permanent, we can think about negotiations about family names. Should it be his? Should it be her? Should it be a combination? We can also think about how to organize economic responsibilities and the important choice of having children but such negotiations are often carried out in a different climate than business transactions. They are more informal, they are more implicit. Calculation is more complicated than in business, where there is a transparent currency useful for measuring gains and losses, namely money. So, in love relationships, a mutual adaption is more common. So, if we should talk about negotiations, it should be in a loose sense of the word. The American sociologist Anne Swidler has written a book called Talk of Love, which has become something of a classic sociological study of love relationships. The empirical foundation is 88 interviews with heterosexual, again, middle-class American couples, <clears throat> Again, somewhat nearsighted empirical uh, uh, grounding. Uh, nevertheless, both the empirical and theoretical aspects in the book add valuable nuances to some of the propositions we have seen so far. Theoretically, Swidler builds on her earlier theoretical works about the role culture plays in organizing social act action. She argues that culture is not a coherent and deterministic body of meanings. It is rife with contradictions and ambiguities. And it is pre precisely therefore that culture can drive social change. Culture furnishes a repertoire or capacities for action that can be mobilized to achieve new objectives, she says, Culture is a toolkit where people, to some extent, can pick and choose. And also in the field of love, people are faced with multiple perspectives and competing experts. Swidler's informants tended to switch between, on the one hand, a mythical and romantic, on the other hand, a more prosaic and realistic conception of love. They seem to draw selectively and pragmatically on these different understandings to develop strategies of action. When thinking about all or nothing decisions, as whether to marry or to break up, people tend to draw on this mythic, romantic view of love. But when managing a marriage or another stable relation that they already have in everyday life, the prosaic view is often in the foreground. People seem to live comfortably with multiple conflicting views, and as we've seen, they use them to justify different actions. And Swidler's perspectives can be seen as part of a more general movement in sociology towards a more agency-oriented sociological theorizing in recent years. But it would be a mistake to include Swidler in the army of proponents of rational choice theorists. Her focus is on meaningful actions more than on consistently maximizing self-interest. For instance, she shows in her study that there is a lot of what she calls culture work going on to shore up marriages and stable relationships including developing commitment and obligation. In conclusion, a love relationship is usually more than a power struggle by selfish actors. No doubt power can be an element in love relationships and love can veil inequalities in gender relations. We have seen this 
in the study of <laughs> Eva Illus. But she is the first to insist that love is more than power in disguise. Love can also move social relationships, she claims. <clears throat> she says there is an egalitarian strain contained in love. And even if love has lost some of its cultural pathos and passion in late modern society, love has indeed a capacity, she says, to subvert patriarchy from within. Continuing this line of reasoning briefly, the word power has other meanings in English than the one implicit in a zero-sum game where one actor exerts power over another actor and where one actor's freedom and gain is the other actor's dependency and loss. Power in English can also mean the power to accomplish something together, to join forces to transcend constraints, as in empowerment, to release synergia, synergies. As an empirically oriented sociologist, I, I hesitate to end up in a basket full of authors of fiction romanticizing love, but uh, I sincerely believe that love relationships can release positive emotional energy <coughs> and make people more empathic for the benefit not only of the couple in question, but also for the wider community and society. Thank you.